All right, folks, we are making our way through the last week of Jesus, and it is a full week. So we began on Sunday with uh, a day of celebration and festivities. Hooray, it's the weekend! And then we hit Monday, and we saw that Jesus kind of had a case of the Mondays. It's a hard, difficult day for Jesus. Tuesday is test day, so lots of, lots of hard, tough questions that Jesus is wrestling with. Well, today, folks, today is Wednesday. Hump day! Um, if you remember, those of you who may have seen it, there was a commercial on television a number of years ago that celebrated Wednesday, hump day. It was commercial by the insurance company Geico, and it was an office building filled with little cubicles, and there's a camel, Mike the Camel, is walking through the offices. Um, it's a real uh, camel, and has a single hump, which is a dromedary camel, and, and Mike is talking with all the coworkers, what day is it, what day is it, what day is it, looking for a response, and then finally one of the coworkers rolls her eyes, and she says, it's hump day, and Mike the Camel goes, it's hump day, and it's all very celebratory. This talking camel annoys his colleagues by reminding them what day of the week it is, and as he walks through the office, we can see the frustration or the burden that all the other co-workers are carrying while they're trying to get their work done. Meanwhile, Mike the Camel is focused on um, the big things, getting through the week and, and seeing us through uh, the, the end of a long and treacherous week. What could be happier than a camel on Wednesday or hump day, as Mike the single hump camel reminds us? When, when I think about traveling through the week, Wednesday is that center day, and so... Um, you know, Monday's hard, difficult, Tuesday we've got some other stuff going on, Wednesday, boy, if we could just get through Wednesday, that leaves two more days left in the week till we get to the weekend. And so, if only we can power through our Wednesday, get the work done, focus on what we have to so that we can continue through the week and get on through the rest of the stuff that is before us. But the trick is um, that Wednesday tends to be a difficult day. So it's, it's like going up a hill. You're like, ah, if only just get to the top of that hill and the rest of the week is downhill and we're coasting. The idea being that um, after you get over this hump, everything else gets a little bit easier. So what gets us through the middle of the week? How do we get through some of this you know, difficult stuff, this task-driven stuff so that we can um, coast through the rest of what is before us. Another way of thinking about this uh, middle-of-the-week kind of scenario is, is imagining that Wednesday to be maybe the hard stuff in our life. So, what helps us get through the hard stuff? Maybe we know there's something on the other side of that hard stuff, of that hump, Maybe we don't know what's on the other side of that hump. We can only see what's in front of us right now, and we begin to worry about um, what is in front of us and maybe what is on the other side of us. How do we go about climbing this mountain and getting over it? Well, one of uh, my favorite uh, psychoanalysts that I learned about in my college studies and seminary studies was Carl Jung. And Carl Jung, had a delightful way about exploring the inner workings of our minds. And one of, one of his really boiled down summaries about what it means to experience strife and struggle in our lives and the way that we go about getting through it, recovering from it, getting healthier and better as a psychologist, was that we have to go through the stuff. We can't expect to be saved from it sort of deus ex machina, the, the, the hand of God reaching down and plucking us out of the turmoil that we find ourselves in. There's a delightful story that is told about a, um, a patient who had a dream about Carl Jung, and she dreamed that she was 
commanded to descend into a pit filled with hot stuff. So this she did, till only one shoulder was sticking up out of the pit. And she cried out for help, help me. And then Carl Jung came walking along and saw her. And he looked down and put his hand out and then pushed her right down into the hot stuff, exclaiming, not out, but through. This is a great little summary and image of what Carl Jung believes we are to be doing when we are faced with the difficult stuff in our lives. No one's going to reach down and pluck us out of the difficult stuff and save us from ourselves or from the woes of the world. Rather, it's by going on the journey and trusting that the journey is going to take us somewhere good. So one of the things that uh, John Dominic Crossan and Marcus Borg in the book the last week try to help us understand is that um, Wednesday is a hard day, and so um, they're going to help us look at some of the hard stuff in our theology. Jesus, in the story today, is um, sitting around at this household and uh, talking with some friends, and he gets anointed by this unnamed woman, and then Judas uh, complains about the wastefulness of this ointment and that it should be uh, sold, that they can use that money um, for the poor, for something really important. And Jesus says, no, 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 listen, why are you after this woman? She's doing something very important, for you will always have the poor. But what she does here today will always be told in remembrance of her. And then Judas goes off and is thinking about all of this, and he's, he's still really frustrated. And he decides then to go ahead and betray Jesus, maybe not at that particular moment, but he goes and betrays Jesus, and uh, as the story unfolds, he exchanges Jesus' life for 30 silver pieces, for money, for profit. So there's an interesting story here going on about, about what is uh, what is the price that we pay? What is, uh, what is valuable in life? And what is priceless? John Dominic Cross and Marcus Borg want to elevate that conversation, this, this hard conversation about what we are really called to be doing as Christians, from the story that is evident in our scripture this morning to maybe what Christianity is all about. And so they write that it's probably fair to say um, that most Christians are um, indoctrinated with a sin salvation model that has to do with uh, substitutionary atonement. And this is the only way that many and even most Christians, contemporary Christians, understand faith in the sacrificial and salvific death of Jesus. Why did Jesus have to die? The theological interpretation of this states, one, that God has been deeply offended and dishonored by human sin. But, two, no amount of finite human punishment can ever atone for that infinite divine offense. So, point number three, God sent his own divine son to accept death as punishment for our sins in our place. And therefore, point number four, God's forgiveness is now freely available for all repentant sinners. It is not just that Jesus offered his life in atonement for sin, but that God demanded it as a condition for our forgiveness. I think that's why sometimes as, as maybe progressive uh, Christians, we get a little like, like, oh, this kind of idea about sin and salvation doesn't sit very well with us. The idea that God demands a ransom for our forgiveness is not congruent with what the scriptures teach. In the Isaiah saying, God even demonstrates that God's own people are redeemed at no charge. There is no ransom that Cyrus 
demands or extracts in order for the people to be free. So how can our God be more punitive than the dictator Cyrus, who frees the Israelite, the Jewish people? This, this, this uh, substitutionary atonement uh, idea of God is grounded somewhat in our idea of God as a judge. A God who is bound by some regulations and some rules and must distribute divine justice according to them. But Cross and Borg and Jesus want to help us shift that to see that God is not a judge, but rather God as a parent. Even this is the language that Jesus uses when addressing God, Abba, Father. It's a relational term, not a term about uh, God's uh, overarching power and, and judicialship over humanity, but as a personable relationship in which we can better understand love and forgiveness. Cross and Abor write that in the Gospel of Mark, for Mark, all this, all that Mark writes about, it is about participation with Jesus and not substitution by Jesus. Jesus does not reach down into the fiery pit and pluck us out and save us from that stuff we're struggling with. Jesus isn't here to do that. Jesus is not the deus ex machina to, to pull us out of whatever turmoil it is. Rather, we are asked by Jesus, invited over and over and over again to follow Jesus on the way, which is how we find salvation in this life. The most common saying of Jesus in the Gospels in our New Testament is, follow me. Jesus says this 87 times, more than anything else that Jesus says. That phrase, follow me. 87 times Jesus says that. And yet, we in the modern church, or maybe over the last couple of centuries, have really formulated this doctrine that says that Jesus is the substitutionary atoner who pulls us out of our own sinfulness and saves us from it. No, no, no. What Jesus is asking of us is to do the hard work to go on the way with Jesus and to follow him. And uh, Marcus Borg and John Dominic Cross do a wonderful job of explaining this very thoroughly in the book The Last Week. Uh, before Jesus gets to Jerusalem for that last week, um, uh, Holy Week experience, Jesus tells the disciples three times that he's going to Jerusalem so that he may suffer and die and that he may be resurrected. But the disciples don't understand this. They either change the subject or they make it about power and authority. There's one scenario where the disciples are arguing about who's going to sit at Jesus' left hand and right hand. Those are the positions of rulers, people of power. But Jesus says on those three different explanations, um, when Jesus explains what's going to happen to him, the disciples have a response, and then Jesus responds to them. Jesus' response in those three scenarios are that you must, if you're going to follow me and be successful, you have to be a servant to everyone. You have to be like a child. And you have to be like a slave. Those are the things that are held in contrast to what the Roman Empire says is successful, is good, and what we should be seeking to achieve in victory. Lordship and rulership. And who gets to sit at the head of the table? Jesus says it's not about that. It's about serving one another and being lowly and walking with me in this work. So back to our question, how do we get over the hard stuff in our own lives? How do we get over that hump that just seems so daunting in the middle of everything? We're like frustrated or exhausted already by Wednesday, we're tired. Here's my advice. 
love. Love what is in front of you. Love what is around you. Love God. Love yourself. Love your neighbor. Jesus even tells us that's some of the most important stuff. Pay attention. Use your eyes. Look around you. Touch the hand next to you. Know that you are surrounded in this moment by good things. Be authentic. Trust who God made you to be. Listen to your heart. Listen to your mind. Trust those around you. And seek ways to do this in a non-violent manner. It is not about conquering that hill, that hump, that mountain, and obliterating it, turning it into nothing. It is about going up and over and seeing it through to the other side. Jesus reminds us that the end result does not justify the means to get it. It is not the kingdom of God by any means necessary. No, it is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, through justice and love and compassion. The means justify the ends. Sometimes we can get so focused on that Friday or that Saturday that we're willing to do whatever it takes to get through the week. But if we do that, we blow right through the week. We don't do the week justice. Sometimes we need to just sit down and focus at the task at hand. That's how you get through a Wednesday. It's getting the work done. It's trusting that everyone else around you is getting their work done. It is doing the work yourself. I want to read you a poem by Mary Oliver, which is just perfect for this day. It's called I Worried by Mary Oliver. <coughs> I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the truth, will the earth turn as it, was, as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it, and I am, well, hopeless. Is my eyesight faded, or am I just imagining it? Am I going to get rheumatism, lockjaw, dementia? Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing, and gave it up and took my old body and went out into the morning and sang. How are we to be rich in life? It is not about worrying about the final cost of it all. Indeed, our lives are priceless, and God's love is priceless. And love is not finite, it is infinite. There is always enough to go around. Richness is enjoying the life present before us in this moment. It is stopping to look at the sun coming in through these gorgeous windows this morning. And going, ah. Richness is stopping to smell a flower or to look at the little buds this spring day as they are beginning to open and bloom before our very eyes. That is the miracle of life. Richness is the woman who stops and breaks the jar of ointment and anoints Jesus in the moment because she knows there will come a day where she will no longer be able to spend that precious time with this precious person. And if she focuses on all the other things to do that day and not sit with Jesus, she will miss, miss that moment. Richness is focusing on the here and now. It is traveling this journey with Jesus and not worrying about the destination. Getting through hump day, Wednesday, means doing the work. Maybe not perfectly, as we see in those disciples who just sometimes don't get it. But then again, following Jesus isn't for the perfect. So may you go and follow Jesus. Pay attention.
know that you are loved. Amen.